Hello, thank you. I was speaking with my colleagues and trying to figure out what language I was going to speak today. And since my English is a little rusty, my Portuguese is even more rusty, and I don't think anyone else here speaks Texan, <laughs> I decided I would try and speak human today. So today we've heard a little bit about freedom and the ideas behind TEDx. It's about setting people free. We also heard about the needs that people have around the world, very effectively done, by the way. Really enjoyed that. We, we made a difference. I didn't donate. I needed more of the story before I put the money in. But the idea is that I would submit that there are just as many people around the world, and perhaps even in this room, who have just as great of a need that's internal as those people have that's external to their bodies. And it's the need to express themselves. It's the need to share something of meaning and feel like they're part of something greater than themselves. That's what I'm going to talk about today with the story of a thousand pots and the productivity paradigm. It's about shifting from, from form, which is very important, to substance in our day-to-day -day activities as entrepreneurs, as entrepreneurs, and innovators. And my personal take on entrepreneurship is that it's universal. Every one of us, every day, has opportunities to be entrepreneurial. The idea of innovation, in my eye, is nothing more than a person caring enough to do something that they don't have to do to make the world a better place. So that's the sort of point of view that I'm coming from. The story of a thousand pots is set in a kingdom. It's set in a small but beautiful kingdom, very far away with a very wise king. And the story of the thousand pots is set in a kingdom that is characterized by two main things. One being very beautiful, intelligent, loving, and welcoming people. The second thing that this kingdom is characterized by is a love for pottery and a long-standing tradition, hundreds of years, perhaps even thousands, of trying to create the perfect manifestation of clay in a way that expresses every citizen in clay. And so the king, who was something of an amateur potter himself because he's the king, and his family had taken all of the great potters who were still alive and all of the potters who had studied the great potters of the past and brought them in and they trained him from birth. A very lucky man. And during that process, he had gotten to know personally each of the great handlers of clay. So he, he decided that he wanted to take his kingdom and really... Uh, unite them behind a common vision. And so what he did was he picked the two leading potters of the day, one from the northeast and one from the southwest, because those are the two areas where most of the clay was turned and spun into pots. And he picked the two that he felt most illustrated the strengths of his kingdom. And he called all the people together in the city square. It was a small but beautiful kingdom. They all gathered, all the people in the city square, and he said, okay, potter from the northeast, you have 999 days to create the perfect pot. Think about the, the potter's past. Think about your colleagues of present, and think about how you can innovate and move forward. Potter from the southwest, you have the same goal but we want to make sure that you show the beauty of your part of our region here. So he said there's only two rules here. The first rule is I will give you an unlimited sum of clay, but that clay will be in one repository in the city square. Anytime you want clay to create a pot, you come down to the city square. You pull it from this repository. You can do it one time a day, high noon. He said, the second rule is that on the 999th day, I will come to each of your studios, and I'll see your pots, and I will proclaim one winner. So the potters went out 
each of them in his own style or her own style. I guess it was, you'd go either way on that. And they began to think about how will I create the perfect pot? This is the king of our land. All the people are watching. Well, one potter set about thinking about what would be the perfect design for the pot and drew drawings and thought about it and prayed on the subject. Got into yoga, tai chi, every means to try and extrapolate the most creative spirit from within to create the perfect pot. And spent 999 days thinking about it and on the last day created a beautiful pot in a fit of inspiration after all of the yoga and tai chi and that was that was his pot. The second potter set about the first day and said I've got 999 days I'm going to build 999 pots and when that potter got up in the morning he would do 30 minutes of jogging on the treadmill turn on some Richard Simmons, do a little bit of dancing. But at the end of each day, this potter created a pot. Some days they were tiny little pots. Some days they were very large pots. But at the end of the day, he conceptualized, he turned, he fired, and he had a pot. So on the 999th day, in comes the king, and the king says, this is wonderful. He said, tell me about the last 999 days. The one potter said, well, I've thought about it, I've considered it. He said, however, here's my perfect pot. I thought of it on the 999th day in a fit of inspiration. The second came in and said, well, I went every day to the repository with all of this clay, but I never saw my fellow potter. It was really on my mind. I never saw him high noon for 999 days. You begin to worry what's going on. But on the 999th day, I'd seen my my good friend from the Northeast, and, and uh, I have these pots to offer, and I chose one. I went through and I chose this one. I think this is my best pot. And the king said, well, folks, you have one day. You have one day for our thousandth day. And we're going to lock you in this room back here, and we're going to say, in this day, we'll take both of your strengths. We have these 1,000 pots to choose from, you guys sit and think about all the things that you're going to do, and I want one pot at the end of that day. And he gathered all the people in the kingdom. That was in their studios. Now they're, they're there in the city square. And these two potters decided that, number one, the person who had envisioned over 990 days had come up with the best drawings in the land, much more innovative in many ways than the one who had come up with a thousand pots. However, the one who came up with a thousand pots had the softest of hands, the most dexterous of hands. It created 999 gorgeous pots, each of different styles. And so when they really looked at these 1,000 pots, it manifested this idea. They said, look, if we take your design and we take my hands after building 999 pots, I'm we can create the perfect pot. And so they went together and they came up with this pot that took in elements from the northeast and elements of the southwest. And in that day, they unleashed the perfect pot. And the king came out and there was a roaring applause. And the king declared the kingdom to be the winner of the contest. He said, people of the northeast and people of the southwest, this is a lesson to you all. Come together, find the strengths that each of you have and create the perfect pot. The one thing, on one hand, is we want to spread the knowledge of how to design a pot. On the other hand, we want to spread the knowledge of how to create the pot. Well, the next few things I'm going to talk about are really more about creating the pot because the design portion, we're lucky enough to have a tremendous amount of knowledge. But there's always a fear of failure. And if you think of the person who's trying to present something to the king at the end of the day, uh, there's a lot of pressure there. So I'm coming up with an, an example. It's Abe Lincoln. He's the President of the United States. He's very famous specifically for the Emancipation Proclamation, which is a time in the United States history when we were in a civil war and slavery was across the land. 
And we have a Declaration of Independence that states that all men are created equal. Unfortunately, we had an inconsistency. Abe Lincoln had another vision, and from a very young age, he tried to manifest that vision. Over his lifetime, from age 7 to age 51 is what this chronicles. Over the course of his lifetime, from age 7, his family was distraught and forced from their home, so he had to work. At age 9, his mother passed away. Imagine that, that beginning. Then he went into business, trying to also increase family wealth because he was the person providing, and he failed. He tried it again and again. He, then he decided, okay, I'm going to go into politics. He ran for nine public offices over the course of his career. He lost all of them until the presidency. He failed in three businesses, and he ended up in a lifetime of debt. He spent his entire life paying off that debt. But at the end, he was elected president in 19... Uh, pardon me, 1860, and at age 51, he began his hardest journey, which was the nation divided. He said, the path was worn, it was slippery, my foot slipped from under me, knocking the other out of the way, but I recovered and said to myself, it's a slip, not a fall. This is the difference between an entrepreneur who's able to be successful over time and an entrepreneur who will never be successful, is that you have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to step out front and say, I'll never give up my dreams, no matter what they are. No matter how many times I fail, I have a vision. So how do we shift from this form to substance in our day-to-day -day lives, our activities as entrepreneurs? Well, the first thing we have to dare to believe and trust that you don't have to think of everything. The bottom line is we have other colleagues around us. We have other artists around us. We have other creative people around us who can help us with that. Identify your controllable things. There's some things we can do nothing about. The weather is beyond our control for the most part, although I think we probably have some scientists in the room working on that. But at the end of the day, what we can control is the portion within. Commit to your decisions regarding, regarding the things you can control and leverage the other as your strength. When in doubt, stop bitching and start working. A mother's wisdom, I'm very lucky. My mom and dad are sort of a yin and a yang. And I think most of you probably have parents who are similar. They both bring something very different but valuable to the table. And mom's entire vision was that my brother and I seek our dreams and believe that we can achieve anything. For better or worse, she definitely got that message across, and we both believe we can do anything. My brother, on one hand, when we were children... Uh, he loved mystery novels. He played cops and robbers. He liked guns, and he liked trucks, and he liked horses. In my case, I liked the French Foreign Legion. I liked books of romance and travel and languages. My favorite toy was the globe, and his favorite toy was a gun. My brother, 10 years ago, was elected the youngest sheriff of our county ever. He was the first person of his political party to win in the county period for decades. As she says today, she knew from our birth where our interests were. And it was really about us choosing to go out and achieve those dreams. In my father's case, his wisdom is about the practical, the ultra practical. He's an entrepreneur. He has four things that he's built every business and every transaction on in his life. One is buy low and sell high. Whatever you do, invest as little as you can on the front end, hopefully well below market, and sell it with added value. Second is maintain low overhead. Make sure you have a high yield. Margin is very important for sustainability. Watch your pennies and the dollars will take care of themselves. This one, I could underscore twice. With my dad, to go out to eat meant that we went out to the patio. It was all about time with the family and not about spending money. Because that was our future. And it wasn't some sort of punishment. What he taught us was, by taking care of these pennies, our grandchildren will have something to spend. 
Put a pencil to it to be sure. In other words, don't let these things be just strictly intuitive. Along the same lines, sort of unrolling with mother's side of the philosophy, I had the distinct pleasure to go to school with a man in Costa Rica. We went to a language school there called the Forrester Institute. And his name was Jack. And Jack was 80 years old. He was a retired drama teacher from a famous university in the United States. And Jack told me, he said, Eli, he said, every single person, no matter who they are, has the ability within them to inspire people, to act, to dance, to sing, to express themselves in a great way. And he said, whatever you do, do it with your clown nose on. I said, Jack, what on earth are you talking about? He said, Eli, I studied under a man in Paris, France, who taught me and used a certain tool called a clown nose, a little round clown nose. He said, if you put this clown nose on, you would be amazed what will come out in people around you. You have every person in the room, and I encourage every one of you to find your teams and the people you work with on a daily basis. Go out and buy a clown nose or two. Get everybody in the room and have each person put on the clown nose and have them seek the inner clown. Jack had me do this. I told him he was crazy. I put on that nose. He said, Eli, I want you to seek the inner clown. And guess what? He's right. A whole different side of my personality came out. More and more and more came out. And we did it over afternoon after afternoon after afternoon until finally I realized Jack was onto something. Well, this is a quote from uh, Michel Tournier after years of reflection on his philosophy and experience with Maurice de Gondillac. He said, your inner clown is just screaming to come out. He said, what you have to do is, whether it's mentally or physically, find some way to manifest that part of yourself because you have something special from within that has nothing to do with something you can learn from a book. It has nothing to do with something you can learn from strictly experience. It's something you have to relax and express in yourself. Make hay while the sun is shining. The idea with this one is that we have a limited amount of time in everything we do. In technology, we know it. In technology, it's extremely acute. It's not always readily apparent, but at the end of the day, if we don't do something immediately, somebody else is going to pass us by. So what I'm going to submit to you is that every single day is a day when you can take that clown nose and put it on. And at the end of the day, show one more manifestation of yourself in your own dreams. And I, I think everyone has a way to do this. And no matter who you are, this is something that you can do for yourself. And it's something that you need to appreciate in others, regardless of station. It really isn't whether or not you're the king, and it's not whether or not you're the street sweeper. It's about finding that expression. In Napoleon number nine is a story of a time whenever I was in Paris. I lived there at the time and attending the Sorbonne. And if anyone's ever lived in Paris or any city with a really old metro system, you find out that they break down all the time. So we went through a couple of months when I couldn't get across the river to get over to the university until I went down the number nine line, which was not my line. That line cost me 45 minutes every single morning. And as I would climb on the train, this fellow would come in. He was of African descent, spoke with an amazing accent in French. And he would say, Napoleon! Napoleon! And he would preach to us for 45 minutes straight about the grandeur of Napoleon and how Napoleon had taken on the whole of Europe and all of the entrenched royals, guided, misguided. He never brought that part up. But what he did say, I believe, and it, it really sort of ate me up as I sat in those long classes at the Sorbonne, which are unbelievable in quality. But this was a little more interesting. This guy with these newspapers who lived on the street, who chose a, a car on the number nine line, he said, embrace, embrace who you are. And what he said was, you're all fools. Every one of you going to work in the morning, what are you thinking? There are people starving in Africa. 
He said, the bottom line is you can't let this fiasco unfold this way. He said, it's your responsibility to embrace. Makes you think about it whenever you've got six hours of classes just after this. So each detour is a learning experience and never underestimate the truly committed and the blatantly sincere. Along the same lines, P.T. Barnum, very famous for his circus, Barnum and Bailey Circus. P.T. Barnum went on vacation. He went on vacation. He's not a man to do this. He went on vacation because he went bankrupt. And he said, I'm going to gather my family. He said, I never have any time with my family. I'm going to take my family to the beach. And we're going to spend two months. In that two months, I'm going to figure out what it is I'm going to do with the rest of my life because I've got to figure out how to feed these people. He was walking along the beach, and he saw a beached whale. So imagine this. Pause for just a moment. This is no clown nose. And you just went bankrupt, and you were a wealthy person. You have all these expectations around you in the world. Your wife and your children are there, and they're looking on. And you say, I'm going on vacation for two months with something you can't even afford to do. And you see a beached whale. How would you react? Well, P.T. Barnum saw an opportunity. So what he did was he immediately ran. He sent off a wire because this was many years ago. And he said, you know, I found our future. And he had this group of people he'd worked with in New York come, and they took the beach whale, and they took it back, and they put it in a museum, and they charged $5 per person to see that whale. And he became a millionaire again. He used that money to roll it into what eventually turned in one of the biggest spectacles of all time with what he called essentially a freak show, which were various things which, if you think today, would, would be a little bit bizarre. We would probably take this sort of thing when we were walking down a beach and we would just feel really bad for the whale. So the idea here is the KISS principle. Keep it super simple. Don't force yourself or your partners to reinvent every wheel. Look for the opportunities in what you're already doing. The SKIP principle is similar. Look at your partners and your friends as opportunities. Admire them because they're good people. They're smarter than you. Surround yourself with those people if possible who have the knowledge and skills in the fields that you do not. And here's the most important when working with them. Here's the key. I have a gentleman who's 70 plus years old who I've come to get to know very well because he is the man who rebuilt my current home with his hands from the ground up. He says he's going to retire in about five years because he's starting to get a little older. And his name is Jim, and he's, his wife's name is Tina. And we always get into these long conversations. And finally, Jim just said, he said, Eli, he said, I've got to go. Wow. Usually, Jim is so relaxed. He wants to talk. He wants to philosophize about life. I said, Jim, I said, and he had done this a couple of times. I said, what is it that you're so anxious to leave for? He said, I said, you're always relaxed. You always want to talk about life. He said, I've got dinner with Tina. I've got to go. Shut out the door. And finally, I got to know him a little better. I wasn't going to say much in the beginning. But I said, why is it that you're always wanting to shoot out the door? He said, well, Tina really believes that dinner is our time, and she works all day to create dinner for me. And he said, you know, I'm the type of guy that I can go to a gas station and see some strange person, and immediately, whenever I see that person, I just want to talk. I just want to find out if I can learn anything. Well, dinner doesn't doesn't mean that much to me if it's just dinner but Tina's worked all day and I know what it means to her allow each person in his or her own way to find order and meaning in a world of chaos the bottom line is that not everyone views the world the same we're looking for the same thing and Bill who's another gentleman who I worked for very early on in my career I was about 15 or 16 in high school he said, get over yourself and don't judge others based on your own perceptions, abilities, and preconceived notions. Because you as an individual with all the things that you have to bring to the world are but one, a speck in the universe. And the bottom line is without everyone else, there's no way you could achieve what you're trying to do. So shifting from form to substance in our day-to-day -day activities, well, think about this list of things. And at the end of the day, the two things I would say most important is one, Consider what it is you're trying to accomplish. Don't forget your clown nose. Whatever you do, don't forget your clown nose. 
Work with those around you that you feel have things that you can't bring to the table. Find a common vision that inspires. And at the end of each day, have at least one pot that you can use and admire. Set out every day with at least one thing that you think is valuable enough that it's worthy of a 24-hour period. And at the end of the day, don't quit until you have one manifestation of something that's important to you. And I submit that if you do that, the productivity will increase significantly, and most importantly, your dreams will come true. People are always talking about how oh, this person, they achieved this, and this person, they achieved that. They must be really lucky. Well, every single person I've ever had the pleasure of knowing who had been truly successful in life had nothing to do with luck. They're usually the people who send the emails first in the morning and send them last in the evening, and they find time for family. I don't know how they do it exactly. But the bottom line is, if you're able to take that, par that, that paradigm and shift it through the creation of POTS, you will see an entirely new level of productivity in your lives. And the productivity is measured by one thing, and that is your satisfaction at the end of the day that you're one step closer to the thing that matters most to you. And my, my opinion is, if it doesn't matter, if it's something that doesn't matter enough that you feel that level of satisfaction, quit your job, walk away, and do something completely different. Because if you don't love it, you're wasting your talent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ella.